Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill be made low, and the rough places shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people, all flesh it says literally, will see it together where the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. So are you ready for Christmas? I mean, somebody's going to ask you, I guess I've already sort of asked you that, but, but uh, somebody's going to ask you that, you know, and, 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 and there is a kind of answer, which is, I, I don't want to go too far into stereotyping here, but it's a little gender linked, okay? Um, and so if you ask a woman, are you ready for Christmas, she's got a list of things that need to be done, you know, the, um, get the invitations out, the meals, the cards, um, the presents, decorate the house, do all these kinds of things. And she might, you know, muse a moment and say, well, yeah, I'm ready or I'm not ready. You know, she knows. If you ask a guy, first of all, he looks at you blankly. <laughs> it's never occurred to him to be actually ready for Christmas. I mean, that's not. And, and then, you know, he thinks about what his duties are and he has one duty. Right? What, you know what it is. Buy a present for his wife, right? That's it. And, and, um, and he, he scratches his head. I mean, if, if this is any day before Christmas Eve, he's probably going to say to you, no, I'm not yet ready yet, right? I mean, have you ever gone to a store on Christmas Eve? I have. And except for the sales clerks, the only people that are there are men. And, um, and they all have the same thing, you know, they, they're, they're like me, you know, they, they go in and, um, and the first thing they lay their eyes on that might be suitable, they go for it. They buy it. They don't even ask the price, right? I mean, the stores could completely rip us off on that day because we just want to get this thing done. And so we, we walk in the store and we say, oh yeah, that looks pretty. And then the, we, we pick out a sales clerk who we think is about the size of our wife and we say, you know, would that fit you? And, and, uh, and then we, uh, right, I, you know. You know. And, then, and then the next, the, the, next, the next question is, and will you wrap it, right? <laughs> and so that's, what if we asked a different question? Are you ready for a different kind of Christmas? For a kind of Christmas which is more biblical. Now, I don't, you know, I'm not criticizing the way we, you know, the cultural way we celebrate Christmas. There's a lot of good things that happen. It's, you know, sometimes preachers like to, you know, kind of preach against all that stuff. That's okay. I mean, I'm not preaching against that. I just want us here in this place to catch what a biblical Christmas really is. And so we've already talked a little bit about this, but the very first thing we need to do is to, um, is to think about um, uh, the direction we're heading. And, and the, the Bible is a future-oriented book. And the future isn't something that we move towards as if we, you know, we're the ones kind of in control and we say, we're going to build the future. No, that's not us at all. That's progress. That's a different thing. No, no. In the Bible, the future is something that is coming to us. I think this is one of the hardest things in faith, to believe that the future is really, really coming. That God is bringing a new heavens and a new earth. That God is bringing a new way to be human. That God is bringing all these things. That the future not only has already come, but has been announced to us in Jesus Christ. Has already been shown to us in Jesus Christ in his first coming. And so, and so you know, we need... 
We need to believe in that future. And a lot of people don't. Even Christians don't. We're not willing to trust it. We think, well, you know, maybe God's going to do that someday, but I'm going to hang on to what I got, and I'm going to do it my way right now, right? You know? Yeah. That's what Chris preparation is about. So today we're going to talk about prepare, and, and, and in that passage that, um, that we just read in a moment ago from Isaiah, it says, you know, prepare the way of the Lord. And the word prepare is a little unusual in, in Hebrew. It's a word which means literally to clear the road. Um, prepare the way for the Lord, a highway for our God. Um, and so it has kind of, I always wanted to put one of those up in church. Um, I know that's, you know, it's, I, I think I said it was a road grader, but I know it's not a road grader, it's a scraper. I, I know the difference, um, and I'd love to drive one of those things. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the whole idea is this kind of road grader idea, and, and it's, it's not just for us, it's for the world. The Lord is coming, the glory of the Lord is coming. As a matter of fact, there's a little interesting, uh, you, you can be interested in this or not, but a little interesting thing in the text, and in the text it says that all of this is about the glory of the Lord, so that, that all human beings can see the glory of the Lord, but in the Septuagint, the Greek translation, the ancient Greek translation that was used by, by the writers of the New Testament more than the Hebrew, it says not only the glory of the Lord, but the salvation of our God. The salvation of our God is coming. And, and then the perspective that Isaiah seems to have here is that we should clear the way so that all the earth, all the world, all flesh, all people can see it. And how do we do that? Isaiah gives us four metaphors four ways to think about I, I, that's all i want to do this morning we don't have a lot of time it's i just want to kind of pop these up they're kind of like balloons okay and, and each of these i could i could spend a long time on as a matter of fact one time i did a whole series and i uh, for advent and the series i did was based um on each of these four things um that that are in this this one verse in in the fourth verse of isaiah uh 40 uh, it's a, but today all I want to do is just kind of pop them up. And so let's start with the valley, the low spots. Let every valley be raised up. Now, I don't, I, you know, I think if we spend a lot of time on this, we understand that Isaiah has in mind um, a whole lot of things which have to do not just with us as individuals, but with us as, as a church and, and with the movement of God's people in general. I mean, there's lots of things that... That we could talk about here, but, but what I want to say this morning is just this. Sometimes, sometimes you get so low, you can't see the glory. You can't see the, the salvation of our God. I mean, that's true for people, right? If you're in the midst of drug addiction, and the biggest thing in your life is to get your next hit. It's hard for you to think about anything else. That is overwhelming to you. If you're in the midst of poverty, you don't have enough to eat, or you're living in some place where there's warfare, and you, there's no safety, you're just trying to hang on for your life. It's really, it, it's, there, are, there are all kinds of places on the earth which are low spots. They need to be raised up. So that people can see the coming glory. Now, how do you do that? I like to think about Bethesda. Bethesda was a kind of ancient hospital, well, more like Lourdes. It's, it was a place where you went and prayed and hoped for a miracle. It was two pools, they've been excavated actually, laying side by side in Jerusalem. And, and there's a, the, a, a piece of ground in between the two pools. There was a colonnade over the top, so there was some shade, and, um, and there the, the sick people would gather, desperately ill people would gather, and the story was, and this is the way the gospel presents it, the story was that if you got in the pool 
when the angel stirred it up, if you were the first one in the pool, you got healed. So one day Jesus goes to Bethesda, makes a hospital visit. And he walks in and he sees a man and it says he saw and knew. He knew the man was desperate. He knew the man was in despair. The man had been there for 38 years. He'd never made it into the pool. He never thought he would ever make it into the pool. He was just there laying on the bed. And what did Jesus do? Three things. The first thing he did was he, uh, he noticed him. As a church, we are called to notice those who are down in the valley of despond, the valley of despair, to see them, to see those who are in the throes of, of addiction, to see those who are in desperate places, to notice them, not just walk on by. The second thing Jesus does is ask him a very interesting question. Do you want to be well? You know? I, I, it's a question that we have to ask the world. Do you want to be well? To ask people. Maybe they're not ready for healing. Do you want to be well? And then, what does Jesus do? He says, take up your mat and walk. He gives him the gift of his word. And in that word is power. There is power of healing in that word. There's power of justice in that world. There is all kinds of power in that word. And that's all we have. All we have, that's what, that's what Peter says in the temple. That's all we have to give is the power of that word. But the word is powerful. Raise up the people that are in the low spots. Huh? And then they're in the mountains, the high spots. Well, I'd like to spend some time here, but I don't really have too much time. Let every mountain and hill be made low. I, I thought I'd put these mountains from China up there just to give you a picture. I think we're talking about religion here. More than anything else, I think we're talking about religion. It is people, religious people, who often stand in the way of other people seeing the glory and the salvation of God. More than the, more than the atheists, more than a people who are on the outside of the faith, I think it's the religious people who stand in the way. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Matthew 23, you not only keep, you not only refuse to yourself go into the kingdom of God, you keep other people from going in. You shut the door to the kingdom of God, said Jesus to the Pharisees. And we do that, we do that. When people look at us, do they see Jesus or do they see somebody who has their own idea about what the faith is? We need to get on our knees and repent. I just started thinking uh, this morning, actually, about what is my life text in some ways from 2 Corinthians where Paul says that... Um, I have this treasure in clay pots. Well, I mean, it does have my name in it, you know? I mean, how, how many of you have your name in the Bible, right? I mean, uh, but for me, it's become increasingly the truth about myself. You know, I am a broken clay pot. I am someone who is broken in a thousand different ways. And if you look at me, you don't see anything that's particularly beautiful or good. But if, if in the cracks of my existence you can see the glory, then, I, then I'm a servant of God, right? We were at, uh, Adrian and I were at uh, Celebrate Recovery. There's Dara. Um, 
yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, uh, this week on Friday. And those are people at Celebrate Recovery who allow themselves to be vulnerable enough so that you can see in the cracks in their existence the very glory of God, I think. It's a great thing. So we got to tear down our pride. Tear down the hills of pride. Christians need to... As a, as, a, as a movement, we need to get down on our knees and pray that we will not stand in the way of other people seeing the glory of God. The third one is the crooked places. Now, I know that it's translated in the NIV, let the rough ground be level, but, but the, the text is doing something really interesting here. The thing that's translated rough ground, that's kind of a guess on the part of the translators. Sometimes we're guessing. And, and the word is a cove. A cove is the word from which you get Jacob. It's a word which means, first of all, heal. Um, it's kind of a physical word. And then it means something that's twisted. It means, you know, Jacob is the heel grabber, which means somebody who, who trips somebody else up. He's a scam artist. He's somebody who takes advantage of other people. All of those kinds of things. That's all caught up in that word, a cove. Let, let the a cove, let Jacob, and then the word for level is mishmor. It sounds a little in Hebrew. Like, uh, like Israel. Let Jacob become Israel. Remember the story. He's this scam artist all his life, and then he has this time he wrestles with God, and finally he comes to the truth of God, and when he comes to the truth of God, he changes his name from Jacob to Israel. What comes to my mind here is honesty. We are sometimes so dishonest with each other and with God. We imagine that we can lie to God. We imagine that we can tell God what we want God to know, that God won't look down in those other places where there is things that we don't want to admit to ourselves or to others. Can we be honest with each other? And honest to God. I mean, God knows already. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to put on a good front. Let the crooked places be made straight. And the last one that I'd like to spend even more time on, well, there's the crooked places, but are the tangles. The, the word, it's translated in the NIV as let the rugged places, and I suppose that's about as good as you can get, but let the rugged, rugged places become a plain. But, but the word for rugged places in the Hebrew has to do with rope, and, and it's about the rope getting all tangled up. And so, um, here, there's a, there it is. Um, <laughs> it's, it's what happens to your Christmas lights, right? You, you put your Christmas lights in a, in a nice, you know, and, and you know, I used to do, I used to wind them up really nicely, and I'd stuck them in a box, and then I'd put them up, you know, very carefully, and then during the off season, when they weren't up, those, those Christmas lights just, I, they, they were busy all the time, tangling themselves, right? <laughs> and I pull them out, and they're all, you know, you, you know how this goes. There are lots of tangles in our lives. In fact, we love to talk about the tangles. This person did this, and this person did that, and, you know, that happened, and that happened, and so forth, and all those tangles, and we're always trying to sort those tangles out. If we could just untie all the tangles, there are tangles in the history of Cross Point Church. You know that if you've been around for a while. And some of us want to just kind of keep untangling them, so we keep, we keep pulling on them, and we just make the tangles tighter and tighter and tighter. But do you remember what Alexander did, the Alexander the Great? He was a young man. He was presented with a Gordian knot, which was a great big tangle. And somebody said, I bet you can't untie it. And he took out his sword, and he went, cut it in half, right? That's what we got to do. Cut the tangles in half. 
We're not going backwards. I have no interest in that. I don't think you do either. We're leaning into the future. Future of Cross Point Church. But more than that, that future which is coming towards us. We have to help people in the world cut through the tangles and get to the glory, get to the salvation. And so those are just kind of little balloons that I popped up, you know, four of them. But I want to um, end with a, a kind of a poem. It's actually a song, and I would sing it for you, but that wouldn't help you at all. I have the philosophy of singing that I just pick a note that seems to me to be a good note, and I, I stick with it, you know? Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is an old song. Well, not real old, but it's old enough. And, um, and this is a song which I think we ought to be singing. This is, this is the, the biblical advent. The king shall come when morning dawns. And light triumphant breaks when beauty gilds the eastern hills and life to joy awakes, not as of old a little child to bear and fight and die, but crowned with glory like the sun that lights the morning sky. Oh, brighter than that glorious morn should dawn upon our race the day when Christ in splendor comes and we shall see his face. That's our job, to clear away the distractions so that people can see the coming glory. They can glimpse the glory. They can glimpse the coming of the, of the glory of God. They can glimpse the salvation of our God, which is coming to us. They can glimpse the redemption that is coming to us and that there can be on this earth hope, real hope. Lord Jesus, for that, for hope, for a world that leans into the future, for a world which is not caught in the tangles of the past, which is not caught in the pride in the past, for people that are so low they cannot even see that they may be raised up, Lord, for those who are, who are having trouble with the truth about themselves and about you. Help us, Lord, to be a place where there is clarity, where there is simplicity, where there is hope, and where there is joy. In Jesus' name, amen.